can have you. Main event of the evening. Hello and welcome to These Days Are Hours, a Happy Days podcast. I'm Peter. And I'm Joe. And today, we are discussing Season 7, Episode 23, A Potsy is Born. Okay, Peter, tell us what happens in A Potsy is Born. We open with the Richie Potsy Ralph Chachi Band, which really needs a name, getting ready to perform at Arnold's. A girl named Loretta tells Potsy she'll be watching. I'll be right over there. Oh, great, great. See you later. After which, she walks away, and a dejected Potsy tells the band she hates his guts. Fonzie shows up, and Richie talks to him about Potsy wanting to impress Loretta. He convinces Fonzie to compliment Potsy in front of Loretta, and though Fonzie is hesitant, he agrees. I mean, I'll go in my office, I'll splash some cold water on my face, you know, and you don't rush into things like this. And Richie says he can always count on Fonzie. The band performs Servant Safari. Mostly it's notable because at one point, Richie crouches on a railing like he's surfing and plays a saxophone, which is great. <laughs> Afterwards, a woman walks up to Potsy and compliments his voice. She's Susan Patterson, owner of the Boat Terrace, looking for a new singer to replace Reddy Beckles. You see, Rennie and the club have had a little parting of the ways, so we're looking for somebody new. She offers Potsy the chance to audition on Friday, and he accepts. Excited, he takes Loretta aside to talk. Fonzie comes out of his office and tries to tell Potsy he's cool, but Potsy tells him, not now. Fonzie grabs him by the collar. Oh no, Fonzie, I'm sorry, I'm just so excited. I gotta rent a tux, get new pictures, get arrangements. And a still elated Potsy leaves with Loretta to make plans. The next day at the Cunningham house, Richie practices his overly effusive introduction for Potsy, which Potsy wrote himself. A man whose voice is a national treasure, the astonishing Mr. Show Business himself, Warren Weber. Howard comes home and reveals there's a huge billboard of Potsy on Benton Drive. Marion is happy for Potsy, but Fonzie, who comes home having nearly crashed because of the billboard, is not, and swears revenge on Potsy as Marion takes him upstairs to give him Mother Kelp's remedy. Fonz, there's two words to remember here. Forgive and forget. Oh no, I got two better words. Seek and destroy. <laughs> Potsy and Ralph show up, with Ralph practicing to be Potsy's flunky. Potsy asks if Richie can improve his playing in time for the audition. Oh, uh, don't you worry, Potts. Uh, my playing is going to be just fine. I'm going to work on it. <laughs> good kid. Also, he wants to ask Fonzie to be his manager. When Fonzie comes downstairs and hears the good news, he is nearly paralyzed with anger. Uh, you're getting upset, Fonz? I'm on my way. Thursday night in the Arnold's men's room, Potsy is going over dance steps with Lori Beth as Chasha takes photographs, Ralph writes jokes, and Richie rewrites the introduction. Al comes in to ask that they stop so his customers can use the bathroom, and they cajole two more minutes out of him. Just a few more pictures, Al. Well, all right, go ahead. Al, for Potsy. They start to argue with each other until Fonzie enters. Potsy tells everyone that rehearsal yesterday was sloppy, and the club has its own band, so they'd better shape up or ship out. Shape, shape up, up or ship, ship out? out? The next day at the club, Susan and her partner just got a phone call about Reddy, saying he'll forget about the raise he wanted if he gets his job back. Susan and her partner decide to let Potsy audition anyway. It might be good for a few laughs. As the band performs Mac the Knife, Susan and her partner pay more attention to their lunch and to the contract. Hey, I ordered ham on rice mm, and some wheat. You know when you get relaxed. When they finish, Potsy asks Susan and her partner if they liked it, but they barely noticed he finished. And they say not to bother with the other song they rehearsed. We'll call you, don't call us, all right? But you said for me to come down and we Bye. did a good job. Great, thanks. A dejected Potsy returns to his friends and calls himself a loser. Loretta assures him he was wonderful and says to call her later, before leaving. Potsy confronts Susan and her partner, and when they're dismissive to him, destroys their table. Just leave us your card. I sure will. Ah! Potsy figures out they were using Potsy and calls them out for being jerks. He also adds that he never met a woman he didn't like, not before Susan. They recover quickly and leave to call back Reddy. The band all assure Potsy he was great on stage, and he apologizes for having been a creep to them. Richie assures him he wasn't that bad, and Fonzie says he was. Nevertheless, all of Potsy's friends forgive him, and Fonzie gives him a thumbs up. Potsy says he's a real lucky guy. Thank you, Peter. That was A Potsy is Born. It first aired back on March 11th, 1980. Happy Days was followed that night by a new Laverne and Shirley in which the girls, now members of the U.S. Army Reserves, go on a survival test with Sergeant Alvinia T. Plout, played by Vicki Lawrence. I am your new drill, Sergeant. Sergeant Plout! 
CBS had a new episode of The White Shadow in which Coach Reeves and his team make it to the city championships. That's good. Only to be struck by a tragedy. That's bad. And NBC had a new episode of The Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo. This week, Deputy Bertie Hawkins' souped-up car, the Bye Bye Bertie, is linked to a bank robbery. So Bertie sits in jail while the real crooks attend a race in Orly. Oh, race. You'll feel the wind in my face. So, Peter, of those three choices, what are you watching? Well, the non-specified trouble sure does sound interesting on the White Shadow, but I really want to see the race and the framing and the souped-up car named after a musical? Oh, my God! I'm definitely watching The Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo this week, and the White Shadow seems almost perversely determined not to be any fun. For the next 45 minutes, citizens are advised to panic and not to enjoy themselves. <laughs> A Potsy is Born was directed by Jerry Paris, and it was written by Rhea Nepis. Rhea had previously written Richie Falls in Love earlier this season. As for guest stars this week, let's start with Pat Crowley as Susan Patterson. Pat is an actress from Pennsylvania who worked extensively in TV from the 1950s to the 2010s. In the very earliest days of network television, she guested on shows like Craft Theater, Armstrong Circle Theater, The U.S. Steel Hour, and more. In the 50s and 60s, you could have seen her on Maverick, Rawhide, The Twilight Zone, The Fugitive, etc. She was a regular on the family sitcom Please Don't Eat the Daisies in the mid-1960s and the crime drama Joe Forrester in the mid-70s. She also did a bunch of episodes of The Magical World of Disney. In the 80s, she was on a lot of primetime soaps like Hotel, Falcon Crest, and Dynasty. In the 90s, she was on Frasier, Melrose Place, Beverly Hills 90210, and more. She also did a lot of afternoon soaps like Port Charles, Bold and the Beautiful, Generations, and General Hospital. So, Peter, what did you think of Pat Crowley as Susan Patterson? She was terrific. She was the perfect blend of surface niceness and showbiz phoniness. I would agree. I like that Pat played a more realistic villain than we normally see on Happy Days. A lot of times, Happy Days' villains are over the top and cartoonish, and that can be fun, but occasionally it's nice to have a more down-to-earth villain like Susan Patterson. I will say that buying an entire billboard with Patsy's giant face on it is a little bit cartoonishly evil, uh, because apparently like, it almost caused Fonzie to crash, and maybe others. So maybe Susan has some blood on her hands. There's blood on your hands, Mrs. Thatcher! Yes, maybe some people died because of the Patsy billboard, we don't know. We also have Gail Edwards as Loretta Campbell. Gail is an actress from Coral Gables, Florida, with lots of TV credits from the late 70s to today. Before this episode, she'd already been on Taxi, Lou Grant, and Barnaby Jones. After Happy Days, she went on to to MASH, Knight Rider, Benson, Three's a Crowd, and Night Court. But she's arguably best known as Dot Higgins on the classic 80s sitcom It's a Living. Life's not the French Riviera. Believe me, life's not a charity bar. She also had a recurring role as Danny Tanner's girlfriend, Vicki Larson, on Full House, which she recently reprised on Fuller House. So, Peter, what did you think of Gail Edwards as Loretta Campbell? I liked her a lot. I like that she wasn't a fair-weather girlfriend. I like that she seemed to genuinely like Potsy, even though I'm not entirely sure why. But she seems to genuinely like him, and she's supportive of him throughout the episode, and she doesn't turn on him when he blows the audition. So that was nice. And then they sing together, and she's got a pretty nice voice. She seems like a genuinely very nice, caring person, and it's refreshing to see that occasionally on Happy Days, where oftentimes these girlfriend of the week characters are manipulative or they're only using the guys for some ulterior motive. And they didn't go that direction with Loretta Campbell, and I was glad of it. And last but not least, we have Arthur Batonitis as Eddie. We've talked about Arthur many times before on this podcast. This is the fourth time he's been on Happy Days. In all, he played five different characters on this show alone, in addition to literally hundreds of other film and TV roles. He was even the claw in The Claw Meets the Fonz. So, Peter, what did you think of Arthur Batonitis as Eddie? He was great. He plays the role in a very weaselly way. He and Susan are more down-to-earth characters, but he does kind of border on being cartoonish. If he was just one degree higher, I don't think he would have been out of place in Fonzie Loves Pinky or The Godfonzer. I would say that Arthur is great at playing these uh, sleazy underhanded characters. That's usually what they have him doing on Happy Day. So this is the kind of part that he's very adept at. As for songs this week, boy, do we have a lot of Anson Williams performances. Let's start with Surf and Safari by Anson Williams. Early in the morning we'll be starting out. Some honeys will be coming along. This was a number two hit for the Beach Boys in 1962. So I guess we're in 1962 now. What do you think, Peter? About. But also, time is weird on Happy Days. All the way back in, I think it was season one, when it was supposed to be 1955. Ambiguously, they were watching The Untouchables, which debuted in 1959. I was surprised to hear this song on Happy Days because it seems to represent 
a different era of pop music than we'd been hearing on Happy Days previously. This is very much a break from the 1950s rock and roll. Honestly, I don't think it does Anson Williams' voice any favors. Like, he's got a nice voice, but this isn't really working for him. But it does give us Richie crouching on a railing like he's surfing while he plays the saxophone. So it's not a total loss. No, I would say that Richie's sax solo really saves this number. And I got to give credit to Ron Howard. He was just about ready to quit the show, but he was still giving it everything he had. He leaps up on that railing like he really cares about this scene. So I was impressed. I wonder if there are any outtakes where he falls off the railing. I hope not. Almost assuredly there are. I don't think he got that right on the first take. I hear they got it on the 17th take. Uh, the next number is Mac the Knife, also performed by Anson Williams. This was originally written by Kurt Weil and Bertolt Brecht for the Three Penny Opera in 1928. <laughs> Bobby Darren had a massive hit with it in 1959. What did you think of Mac the Knife by Anson Williams? It sounds way better than a surfing safari. It's kind of a nicely jazzy number, and it, it fits his voice very well. Oh, the shark bait has such teeth, dear, and it shows them early white. Although I will say that it's super weird that this incredibly dark song from a very long and dark opera about how fascism is dangerous became a pop standard. I don't think many songs in the 20th century had a weirder path than Mac the Knife. And the song, even as a jazzy up-tempo number, has all these lyrics about killing people and dumping the bodies and blood spilling on the sidewalk. And I think Anson does a great job with it. I think it's much more suited to his voice and his personality than Surf and Safari. This is the kind of song I would be steering him toward. And at the end of the episode, we get Oh Boy, performed by Anson Williams and Gail Edwards. All my love, all of my kissing, you don't know what you've been a missing, oh boy. Oh boy. When you're with me, oh Boy. Buddy Holly and the Crickets recorded this in 1957, and it became a hit in 1958. What did you think of Oh Boy by Anson Williams? It's a solid number. I wouldn't say it's anything spectacular, but it's hard to go wrong with a nice, sturdy song like Oh Boy. Gail Edwards has a nice voice, and I think she adds a little something to this performance. As for cultural and historical references this week, this is the second Happy Days episode named for A Star is Born, the first being A Star is Bored from Season 2, so they're already running out of title puns seven seasons into the show. There will be more. And they will be slightly awkward. And Richie says, Hang on to your hats, you big boppers, because we're going to be rocking and rolling this joint in just one minute, all right? J.P. Richardson, a.k.a. The Big Bopper, was a songwriter and DJ from Texas who had a smash hit single with Chantilly Lace in 1958. He also wrote the hit songs White Lightning for George Jones and Running Bear for Johnny Preston. Unfortunately, in February 1959, Richardson was killed along with Richie Valens and Buddy Holly in a plane crash. This is a tragedy that would have been very fresh in the minds of the audience at Arnold's. Do you think it's a little too soon for Richie to be making that reference? It's too soon for them. Fonzie references The Lone Ranger once again. You know, The Lone Ranger would do of course, he's smart enough to wear a mask. We've explained many times who this character is and where he comes from. If you're just joining us, this character debuted on Detroit Radio in 1933, and he had a popular TV show in the 1950s. The reason he wore a mask was because his secret identity, Texas Ranger John Reed, was supposed to be dead, killed by the Cavendish gang. Well, but uh, it also has the pleasant side effect of not being able to embarrass himself. Richie says, the show must go on. The exact origin of this phrase is unclear, but it has been traced back to 19th century circuses. The ringmaster would try to keep the show going, even if a performer got injured or an animal escaped. So it sounds like 19th century circuses were terrifying? Oh yeah. Most things in the 19th century were terrifying. It was a bad, bad time. So if you were going to the circus back then, you're basically saying, you know what, we're probably going to die. But <laughs> this will at least provide a little bit of entertainment as we're being eaten by an animal, I guess. <laughs> Just crushed by an elephant freeing itself from its abusive circumstances. Hey, come on. Pop, the show must go on. Yeah. The Vogue Terrace was a real nightclub in the 1940s and 50s, but it it was in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, not Milwaukee. It was bought out and converted into a dinner theater in the 60s, but it still inspired a lot of nostalgia for Pennsylvania residents over the years. And as listeners may have picked up when I was doing the plot summary, I kept mishearing it as the boat terrace. And I was confused by that because is it a nautical themed club? I, I guess that could be fun. Are you a boat or not? <laughs> On the other hand, Benton Drive, the location of Potsy's billboard, is fake. Don't go looking for it. Ralph mentions a joke about a man who walks into a bar with a pelican on his head. This is a real bar joke. The bartender says, what can I do for you? And the pelican says, get this man out from under me. 
Fonzie says there's something rotten going on here in Bangkok. What he means is something is rotten in the state of Denmark. That line is spoken in Act 1, Scene 4 of Hamlet, a play that Fonzie should know by now since he played Hamlet. Yeah! Maybe he's doing it on purpose so that they'll underestimate him. But come on, dude. I think the reason they're doing it is because malaprops have become a big part of Fonzie's character, even though it's a trait that's completely ripped off from Archie Bunker. You know, take your big international bankers. Uh, they want to, what do you call, uh, masticate the people of this year nation like puppets on a wing. Other observations this week. The new Arnold's has a lot of delicate-looking knickknacks everywhere. It looks like somebody's grandmother designed it. But on the other hand, those swinging doors make for some dramatic Fonzie entrances. So I guess the new Arnold's has pluses and minuses. Your thoughts? You describe Driving it like that makes me wonder if Fonzie got help from Grandma Nussbaum to decorate it. That's my headcanon now. Grandma Nussbaum helped out with the decor. That's what I think now, too. I'm pretty sure Grandma Nussbaum provided some of those plates that they're hanging up on the wall. The band keeps Richie very busy. He doubles on both guitar and saxophone. If you watch during Surf and Safari, he actually swaps out his guitar for a saxophone and then saxophone for guitar. So Yeah, instead of replacing their old drummer with Chachi, they should have just gotten a new guitarist and or saxophone player. It feels like a cheat that we never see Potsy's billboard. Any modern sitcom would show it. Do you think we need to see Potsy's billboard or is it better that we don't see it? I would have loved to have seen it, but I think it is still very funny if we just imagine the giant Potsy billboard. Just Ansley Williams' face blown up to giant proportions. (laughs) And he's described as having teeth the size of a door. (laughs) That was one of my favorite lines, too, about... Potsy's teeth being the size of Cunningham's front door. How was that billboard created, by the way? Potsy has not auditioned by this point in the story, nor has he taken his publicity photos. How did they make it? It's worth mentioning that I was very confused by that at first because I thought, wait, how did Potsy make a billboard of himself? Where did he get the money for that? And then it turns out that Susan Patterson did that as another negotiation tactic with Reddy. So my guess is that she just asked him for like some old pictures of himself and he gave them to her. Potsy probably would have a lot of pictures of himself around. And I also briefly thought that Potsy had paid for that billboard himself, you know, and was promoting himself prematurely before he'd even started performing at the Vogue Terrace. So uh, I'm glad somebody else thought that as well. And I think it's meaningful that it's Fonzie who comes to Potsy's defense at the end, uh, since it was Potsy who caused Fonzie to have such a rotten week. Even if Fonzie doesn't really like Potsy, He does have a strong sense of justice, and Potsy is, at the very least, a friend of his friend. So, yeah, it's nice that he helped him out. So, Peter, were there any outstanding Happy Days fashions this time around? I really like the outfits that Susan Patterson wore. They were very 80s businesswoman, or at least they would be if she had shoulder pads. But, yeah, it's kind of a fun reference to how, even though it is the 1960s, in-universe, out-of-universe, it is the 1980s. And pretty soon, Happy Days is going to stop bothering with trying to accurately capture the aesthetics of the 1960s. Oh, they're going to give all the way up on that. So, Peter, I will ask that age-old timeless question, was this episode any good? Yeah, this was a pretty fun one. I don't know if it's one of my favorites, but it's fun. And I like the villains a lot. As Potsy stories go, a Potsy is born is as good as you're going to get. This is probably one of the better showcases for that character. And I hope that Anson Williams really savored this week because we are coming to the end of the seventh season and the end of the Richie and Ralph era of the show. And from seasons eight through 11, Happy Days is going to have a lot of trouble figuring out what to do with Potsy. They're going to have similar trouble figuring out what to do with Lori Beth, but I can at least think of a few Latter-day Lori Beth stories on Happy Days, and I can't think of too many for Potsy. There are exactly two that I can think of. Well, I guess we will get to those. In the meantime, we have A Potsy is Born, which I think especially if you're a Potsy fanatic, is a fun episode. Even if you're not, it's enjoyable. There's some songs, there's some good guest stars. I would basically recommend it. So, Peter, how can people keep up with us and find out about all the wonderful things we are doing? Listeners can follow us on Twitter at Fonzie Podcast. They can follow me on Twitter at Peter Volfron. That's P-E-T-E-R-V-U-L-F-R-A-N-C. And they can follow me on Twitter at Joe underscore A underscore Blevins. They can find this podcast online at thesedaysareours.libson.com. And they can email us with questions, comments, and concerns at thesedaysareourspodcast at gmail.com. So, Peter, what do we have on the docket for next week? Next week? It's pretty much just an excuse to put the cast of Happy Days in old-timey costumes in the Roaring Twenties. This is one I've been looking forward to for a while, so see you later, alligator. In a while, crocodile. As I was walking down the street, a billboard caught my eye. The advertisements written there would make you laugh and cry. The signs were torn and scattered from the storm the night before. And as I read the things they said, why, this is what I saw. Smoke Coca-Cola cigarettes, drink Wrigley's spearmint beer. 
Kettle ration dog food keeps your wife's complexion clear. Two chocolate covered mothballs, they always satisfy. Brush your teeth with Life Boy soap and watch the suds go by. Seek and destroy. <laughs>